So today on the podcast, we have Dylan Johnson. He's a professional endurance cyclist. Uh, he's a complete animal. He puts over a thousand hours in the saddle every year. He races off-road races, 200 miles plus. He runs a successful YouTube channel where he covers in-depth endurance sports stuff and all things cycling. Uh, we have a great discussion. You guys are going to enjoy this one. Uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe and share the podcast with some friends. I think a lot of these stats will shock guys who don't ride bicycles. Uh, how many how many kilometers or miles do you ride per year? And kind of what are you at right now? Per year, okay. So I, I think in miles because I live in the U.S., right? <laughs> yeah. But um, I think that last year, you know, I go, I usually look more at the number of hours that I've ridden in the miles because it's a little bit more relevant for training. I think I did close to a thousand hours of training in 2021, maybe a little shy of that, like 900 something. Jeez. So that's, you know, ballpark in miles. What do you, what is that? I don't know. Maybe 15,000 or something like that. Maybe, maybe more crazy and what does what how many times a week are you riding to do that and, and how many hours per day yeah i mean i i ride usually six days a week um and the number of hours per day completely varies depending on the day um and the time of year so i mean i i, I take a solid off season and in the off season i still ride but it's probably 10 hours per week and then when things start to ramp up and i need to get ready for the season that could go up to 20 to 30 hours per week. And then usually in season when the racing is actually happening, the volume goes down a little bit more um, just to stay fresh for racing. So it's probably 15 to 20 hours. So if you're trying to think, okay, how many miles per week is that? That's probably anywhere from 250 to 400 miles a week. Right. Okay. And how does that compare or differ to a guy like the Tour de France is on right now? Everyone's watching that. How does that differ from a guy, you know, any one of those guys? Yeah. So, uh, I would say that probably most of them are training even more than that. And, um, and (laughs) if I could train more, I would, but, uh, like the amount that I'm training is just coming up on the edge of my physiological ability to recover from. Um, and, and these guys in the Tour de France are obviously freaks of nature. Uh, so they can, they can train even more than that. Um, although some of them, so there are probably some of them doing the tour right now and their volume is very similar to mine. Um, they're probably doing more miles because they're doing all their riding on the road and the average speed on the road is, a bit faster. I ride on the road too, but I do obviously a fair amount of riding off-road since I'm an off-road racer and the speed is lower, hence the distance is a little bit lower. Right, right. When did you, uh, when did you get into cycling or, or competitively, uh, you know, racing? Yeah, I, um, I think that my dad got me a mountain bike when I was uh, probably 12 years old. And did you not, I, did you not ride, ride bikes before that? Like my whole childhood, like my cousins and, and my brothers, like just growing up riding bikes, you know? Yeah. I mean, I rode like a BMX bike around the neighborhood. Right. Sure. Um, I feel like, I feel like most kids have like, if they've got a bike, it's probably like some sort of BMX bike. I don't know what you had, but yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, I would take it off jumps and stuff, but I wouldn't really call that uh, like I was riding a BMX bike around the neighborhood is different than doing 20 or 30 miles. Sure. Um, It's, it's a very different thing. So I would say that started for me around 12 when I got a mountain bike and then I started racing mountain bikes at 14 ish. And I think I got progressively more serious about it. I think I would say that I started training Um, meaning that I wasn't just going out for a ride and there was no structure to it. I started training with some sort of structure, probably around uh, 16. Okay. And you start, and that's cross country stuff. Yeah, that was cross country mountain biking. And then I also did my first 
ultra endurance mountain bike race, um, the Shenandoah 100 when I was 15. So I, I was actually better at ultra endurance racing. I think it might just be, you know, my physiology. I'm, I'm usually the longer the races, the better I do relative to my competition. Um, so there was a period of time kind of in my late teens where I was trying to be a cross country mountain bike racer. For those of you who aren't familiar with cross country mountain bike racing, that's typically an hour and a half long mountain bike race because it's an hour and a half. That may seem like a long time to people who don't ride bikes, but that's a relatively short bike race, you know, relative to other types of bike racing. So it's very high intensity. Um, when I'm talking about ultra endurance mountain bike racing, I'm talking about a hundred miles uh, or more. And we're talking about taking seven to eight hours or maybe more to complete. So it's a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't know. It, to compare it to something, it'd be like doing a, a mile race on the track versus a marathon runner. Right. Right. What did, so you had that goal, you know, for a brief period of time, I assume like world cup cross country stuff. What, what, um, you know, as far as making a living doing it, what's, what looks better going, going and trying to do the world cup cross country stuff or what you're doing right now? Well, it just depends on if you can make it to the world cup level and there's very, there's not a lot of world cup level riders making a living out of it. You have to be probably within the top 40 best riders in the world in cross country mountain biking in order to make a living out of it. And, you know, I don't know, people could say, uh, that's, you know, that's sad or that, you know, that's, that's a shame that, but it's, I don't know. It just comes down to, is there enough money to support these racers? <laughs> no, totally. I get it. You know, we're, um, yeah. so it, it, there's not there, you know, there's not a lot of cross country mountain bike racers making a living out of it. Um, and, uh, like the level of rider that I am, um, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a top 40 cross country mountain bike racer by any means. And I'm not, I'm not at the level of a, of a tour de France rider either. Um, I'm probably at the level where I'm, I'm in the top 40 domestically. So like I'm a top 40 cyclist in the U S right. Um, not in the world. Right? right. But fortunately there's uh, there's been a huge surge from the industry uh, in, in this gravel scene. And there's, there's a lot of money coming into gravel right now. And I would say that if you're, I mean, if you're in that top 40 in the U S for gravel, you could totally make a living out of it. Um, maybe not the best living in the world, but you could definitely pay your bills being a gravel racer right now at that level. Right. So backing up to, um, you kind of switching your focus, uh, I guess you're coming out of high school and I've, I've heard you say that you went to college down in North Carolina. What was the, uh, kind of thinking behind that was the bicycle career kind of on hold or you're going to do it simultaneously? <laughs> yeah. So I kind of, I'll be honest, I kind of picked the school just because it had a good cycling team, Okay. probably more so than the academics, which, you know, looking back on it probably wasn't the best decision, but, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the team at, so I went to Brevard college in Western North Carolina in the mountains and the team had won multiple collegiate mountain bike national uh, championships. I think multiple cyclocross national championships as well. So, and, and when I, when I went to Brevard college, I was part of, uh, part of two national championship winning teams. Um, so that was, that was super cool. Um, and when I was at college, I studied exercise science, which I think kind of led me down the path to doing what I do now with my YouTube channel, which is super geeky, sciencey, you know, bike related content. Right, right. I actually know the area pretty well. My uh, my cousins, uh, when we were 11, they moved down to Pickens, Pumpkin Town area uh, in South Carolina. So uh, I, ride, I ride there all the time. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I you know, smoke. Have mountains. you done the, uh, have you done, um, Caesar's head climb? No, I haven't. Oh man. I mean, that's right. So Pickens and, and pumpkin town is right at the base of Caesar's head climb. Caesar's head climb is probably, uh, one of the most popular climbs for road cyclists in that area. Okay. So I've gotten, I was just golfing with a guy who was down there a couple of weeks ago and I've got an open invitation to go ride with him and his group next time I'm down. So maybe I'll suggest that. Yeah, you should definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, you know, I assume it was a few years after school, but what, what was the impetus or what sparked you to start creating these YouTube videos? Yeah. So Immediately out of college, I started working for Carmichael Training Systems, um, which is just a, you know, a coaching company, um, pretty widely known. Um, and I, I guess when I started working for them, I was sort of led to believe that they would just set me up with all the clients that I need. Um, and I could try to recruit clients if I wanted. But, you know, the whole reason why you would even work for them in the first place, because they do take a sizable cut. Mm. Is because hopefully they'll provide you with athletes so that you can make a living. And I don't know, I was like a year in and I was, I mean, I was so like, I was living off of less than a thousand dollars a month. Sure. And, um, because I just, I didn't have that many athletes. Like I barely had any athletes. Right. And I remember at the time I wasn't get, getting paid from spot. I had sponsors that were like providing me bikes and equipment. So I didn't have to buy that, but I, I, you know, I wasn't getting a paycheck from sponsors. And I remember I would go to these bike races that had, you know, like $500 or a thousand dollars, uh, pay out for the win. And I was like, I need to win that race so I can pay my bills next month. Wow. Wow. So, you, wow. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, like, you know, it's like so many sports though. You look at, you know, rock climbing or skiing or a lot of these endurance sports. It's, it's that kind of bum lifestyle to make it happen, especially when you're putting in so many hours in the saddle. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, rock climbers seem to be good at it. seems like, seems like a ton of rock climbers do the van life, uh, thing as well, as well as plenty of cyclists. So yeah. So did you move on from there? Are you on your own now doing, doing training stuff? How did that progress? Yeah. So what I was, I, what I was going to get into is that I started the YouTube channel mm. kind of as a way to, uh, get clients. And also, I mean, I just, I, I just kind of wanted to see if I could be a YouTuber literally in the first video that I made at the end of the video, I said, you know, uh, like the video and subscribe, <laughs> like, you know, like typical, typical YouTuber. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had no subscribers and I'm telling people to subscribe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when the YouTube channel took off, I mean, I was getting enough clients from YouTube that I didn't need to, I didn't need CTS and they, there's no point in working for them. If, if you can get clients on your own, cause like I said, they take a pretty sizable chunk yeah um, of what the athlete is paying so you know i i went off on my own and and now yeah i'm doing my own thing with coaching right so your your videos are pretty pretty in depth and and uh one of the ones i found early on that was like a um you know good news to someone like me who doesn't have a lot of time or anything um and why don't you share with the people just how you you it was, it was something like just training in zone one, like how you, you know, you get, you buy a bike, you go out and you start riding and you think you've got to blow your brains out on every ride. Um, but just putting in, putting in miles or kilometers is, is kind of the ticket. Why, why is that? Can you explain that a little bit better? Sure. I just did. So, um, for people who are interested in this, what, what this is called, uh, in in the scientific literature is polarized training. And then you can adjust it a little bit and it, and it be called pyramidal training. And I, I just had an interview on my channel with, uh, Dr. Steven Seiler who coined the term polarized training and did a lot of the research on, that I'm talking about, going to talk about here. So what, what he found, um, and, and he, he came up with this hypothesis by actually observing what pro 
endurance athletes do. So not just cyclists, but runners and, and cross country skiers and rowers. Um, what they were doing was that they were spending the vast majority of their time at a relatively low intensity. And then they were spending a little bit of their time at a high intensity, which, you know, is probably counterintuitive for a lot of people. They would think, okay, you're a pro endurance athlete. You got to be doing hard training all the time. Um, and I don't know, it just turns out not to be the case. So, you know, there, there have been plenty of studies at this point where they've, they've compared this kind of mindset <laughs> where let's do hard training all the time, have a group of people do that. And then, and then have a group group of people do a more polarized training approach where, you know, 80% of the training they're doing is a relatively, is relatively easy. And then, you know, maybe 20% is pretty hard. And, and it's like, without a doubt, uh, almost every single time the polarized group is coming out on top. Right. Um, so, <laughs> you know, maybe that's good news to some people, maybe some, there are, there are plenty of people that don't like that. They just like to get on their bike and smash it every time they get on their bike. But uh, I think if you ride enough, and when I say enough, uh, um, it's probably only six hours a week is enough. But certainly when you're getting to 10 hours a week or 15 hours a week or more than that, it, you're going to be relieved that, that it's an easy day, you know, cause, cause you're riding enough that you can't go hard every single time you ride. Right. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I was definitely up there in that, that one summer kind of a, I've had off now my bicycle is collecting a little bit of dust now that we're back to racing full time but I'll get back on it in the fall. I've got a, I've got a few selfish questions, uh, as a race car driver. Um, our biggest struggle or battle is the heat. Um, you know, it's just stupid, hot, uh, hydration. Um, you know, if I've got access to a water bottle and whatnot, but, uh, it's really, it's really staying mentally focused, um, you know, and physically, not kind of panicking in those super, super hot situations. Do you have any, any tips or anything like that? I'm sure you do some heat training. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty critical to performance and, and honestly, uh, you know, people talk about altitude acclimation for high altitude racing. I would say that heat acclimation for any sort of, uh, activity where you're going to be hot is probably equally important. Um, so heat acclimation just basically involves doing activities in the heat. So if you were to, for example, if you were to ride your bike in the hottest part of the day in the summer, that would probably be good preparation for that. And of course, hydration is important too. Do you, so <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm a little bit ignorant of how you hydrate while you're driving a race car. Do you have like, um, do you just have like a water bottle that, cause obviously you're wearing a helmet. Yeah. It depends on the race. Depends how long it is. Um, you know, depends on, on a lot of stuff, but, uh, like for, you know, some guys will have a built in drinking system right through their helmet where they can just grab it like a camelback. Um, right now I just run, uh, a water bottle with a long straw and I just grab it under caution. So I'm, you know, under yellows. Um, yeah, I don't drink while I'm, while I'm running green flag runs. Right. Right. And, and when you're racing, how long are you racing for? Uh, I mean, it really depends, but, uh, call it in the Canadian series, they're a little bit shorter races. So call it a maximum of two hours. Whereas, you know, down in the States, you're, you're looking at sometimes close to four hours. Yeah, I mean, two hours, two to four hours is, is, is certainly in the range where hydration is critical. I, you know, it, I was going to say, if, if we're talking about a less than half hour race, it's like, well, you're going to be hot, but you know, yeah, what, what you're doing with your hydration in that amount of time is not super critical. But if, if it's, if it's over an hour, it's, it's very important. Do you do straight water or do you do any electrolytes? Yeah, I'll stick um, some electrolytes in there, like maybe BioSteel right now. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Is that what you do? Uh, yeah, I would. I would probably recommend doing that. Do you do 
are, are there any carbohydrates in there or do you do any carbohydrate intake while you're racing or no? no? No. So that was kind of my, my next question for you. I've been thinking about that. Um, but no, I don't do any right now. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, you know, obviously race car driving is different than bicycle racing. Right. Um, but there's plenty, <laughs> There's plenty of research on endurance activities that show that uh, carbohydrate intake while you're doing the activity, even if the activity is not that long, like, you know, you're doing, you're riding for 20 minutes, you're not going to blow through your carbohydrate stores in 20 minutes, but even, even for an effort of that length, taking in carbohydrates can increase performance. Mm. And I have, I haven't read studies about this on race car drivers, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if the same is true in race car driving. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I've been thinking about that. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot. Do you, I don't know if you wear a heart rate monitor while you're racing. Uh, no, I've seen, I've seen a good amount of data, uh, from other drivers. I just haven't taken the time to set it all up. Um, but man, it definitely gets up there. And, and I think, the heat is definitely a factor. Um, if you look at like your heart rate when you're in a sauna or something like that over 35, 40 minutes, it, uh, the heat, the heat definitely gets it going. Yeah. I, so heat, heat is going to increase heart rate. Um, what I find super interesting about heart rate and, and I've, you know, talked to professional downhill racers about this. There, there are a number of professional downhill racers who live downhill mountain bike racers who live in uh, Brevard, they'll say that they hit their max heart rate in a downhill run when they are not pedaling their bike, literally doing zero Watts. Right. Um, and of course they're working, right. Because they've got to, they got to move their bike around a lot when they're, they're doing a downhill run. Um, but it's, you know, they're, they're putting zero Watts into the pedals and they're hitting their max heart rate. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same for race car drivers. Yeah, certainly I've seen some instances for sure. And then, yeah, definitely, pretty high heart rates um yeah just adrenaline or whatever it is as well yeah do you uh do you do i i guess a question for you leading up to those big races that you do that are you know are going to be hot what do you do for hydration in kind of the week leading up to it yeah i i'll be honest my my hydration the week leading up to a race doesn't look that different than a normal training week and sure. and to be honest the week leading up to a race i'm usually tapering which means that i'm i'm riding less than i normally would um so i mean proper hydration is important at at all times not just if you have a race around the corner right so yeah. so i'm i'm staying on top of hydration all the time not necessarily just Right. Are you, are you taking like, you know, magnesium or calcium supplements kind of thing as well? Like stuff like that, potassium? Yeah, I don't, I don't supplement with any of that. The, um, I'll take B12 once a week, but I'm not, I'm not a huge supplement guy, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, I, I'm kind of more in the camp of if you can get it from a healthy diet, that's, that's the best, best approach, you know, that's preferable. Of course, that's easier said than done, right? Sure. <laughs> so um, I, I try to do that. Right. And on a weekly basis, are you doing anything like sauna or cold plunges before or after rides to try and help? Yeah. So when I was trying to heat acclimate earlier this year for a race that I knew was going to be super hot, but it wasn't very hot where I, you know, where I was in North Carolina, like I was riding in. 70 to 80 degrees and i was preparing for a race that was going to be 100 degrees um i did have a a sauna that i would go into straight after my ride for 45 minutes and crank it up to you know 130 degrees um which is pretty miserable yeah <laughs> you think sauna and you're like oh that's relaxing it's if you're doing it right it's not really relaxing at all no, no, I do it all the time. And it's almost like, you you know, you got to focus on your breathing to not panic in there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, as far as like ice baths and, uh, and cold water immersion, um, 
So the research is interesting. It does seem to help with recovery, but here's the kicker. And this is actually something that should be investigated for all recovery protocols is that ideally you want something to um, speed up recovery, meaning that you're feeling good again quicker. Um, it's not taking you days to recover. It's taking you, I don't know, 24 hours and then you feel good again and you can do a workout, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want it to hinder the adaptation to exercise because the, right. adapt the exercise is what's making you fitter. And there, there, are, there are things out there that, Im that uh, speed recovery, but actually hinder adaptation. A um, example that I can think of off the top of my head is super high dose vitamin C and vitamin E supplementation, um, especially immediately after exercise has been shown to speed recovery, but hinder adaptation. Um, meaning that people are not getting as fit when they're doing super high dose supplementation of, uh, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E. Um, so hmm. As far as the ice baths go, there's, I would say the research is inconclusive, but there is, there are some studies that show that, you know, in weightlifters, weightlifters who actually did an ice bath after their session didn't make as many strength gains as weightlifters who didn't do that. Um, so like I said, it's not, it's not conclusive research, but it was, it was enough research for me to be like, yeah, I don't need to do ice baths. Right, right. Got it. Um, a book I read recently was Breath. Uh, I don't know if you've read that book or The Oxygen Advantage, uh, you know, basically on nose breathing versus mouth breathing. Do you have a, opinions on that? Have you looked into that? You know, breathing has been a highly requested topic, and I just haven't done enough research on it. But uh I, it's on my list of videos to get to. And when, you know, when I sit down to do all the research on it, I'm sure I'll have some sort of opinion, but as of right now, I haven't no. done enough research on it. To <laughs> so do you, do you, are you even conscious of what you're doing while you're riding? Uh, mouth breathing. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a point, there's a point of physical exertion where it's extremely difficult to do nose breathing. I don't, I right. don't know what the, I yeah, don't know yeah, what yeah. the book says or the research says, but. Right. No, I get that for sure. Um, so I was telling you before how much I've enjoyed just watching bicycle races because they're so tactical and I can totally appreciate the draft and, you know, sitting, sitting in fourth, sitting in fifth, coming to the line kind of thing. Um, can you explain some of the, you know, it might be different than, than a race car because we only have X number of horsepower and we're using, you know, maximum at all times. We're not, it's not a, a physical sport. Um, can you explain some of the different ways you might go about winning a race, you know, sitting in third or a breakaway at, you know, hundred miles out or something? Sure. Yeah. Um, so this probably plays the biggest role in road racing, but it definitely plays a role in gravel racing and it can play a role in mountain bike racing. Um, when we're talking about drafting and aerodynamics. Um, so bicycles are going at, uh, relatively a slow speed compared to race cars or, or anything else, but they're going fast enough that aerodynamics still matters and it can actually matter quite a bit. Um, and when you're, when you're drafting, meaning that you're sitting right behind a rider, um, you could be doing half the power of the rider in front of you. Like the rider in front of you is doing 300 Watts. You could be sitting on their wheel and doing 150 Watts. Um, so it's, it's very significant, the drafting benefit. So that's why when you watch the Tour de France or something, you're seeing these riders in a massive group, a massive clump, and they call it the Peloton and, um, and probably, you know, probably people that aren't familiar with bike racing, just assume that the people in the front of the clump are winning. Those people are not going to win the race. Those are the, what they call the domestiques. They're basically like the workhorses hit, you know, hitting the wind so that, you know, their sprinter or, or their climber or their GC guy, you know, when the moment is right, they can go ahead and do whatever they need to do to win the race. 
So whatever you need to do to win the race could be different depending on the course. If the course ends with a massive climb, then you need to save as much energy as you can until you get to that climb. And then, and then you, you know, um, depending on how steep the climb is, drafting could still play a part, but generally it's like, who's the best climber get to the top first, or if it's a pretty flat race, um, the race could come down to a sprint finish. And that's, that's actually usually what happens in flat road races is the race comes down to a sprint finish. Like this clump has been riding together for over a hundred miles. I mean, these races are a hundred to 150 miles. So it doesn't seem like a sprint by any means, but they'll often call it a sprint stage because it's so flat that they know it's going to come down to a sprint. And, and the Peloton is still together with, you know, a kilometer to go in the race. And then at that point, these lead out trains form where they try to, you know, the sprinter is sitting, you know, third wheel or something. And then you've got guys trying to, um, trying to, they're breaking wind for their sprinter. So their sprinter can save their energy for the last 200 meters of the race. And the sprinter didn't touch it. If the sprinter does it perfectly, they probably didn't touch the front of the race until the last 200 meters of the race. Right. right. And then they sprinted as hard as they could and they won the race. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of tactics involved. And then of course, sometimes a breakaway wins and a breakaway is, is uh you know a group of riders that is ahead of the peloton like it could be could be one rider could be 20 riders but you know it's it's a smaller group of riders that's ahead of the peloton they're usually not good sprinters probably not the best climbers so their chance of winning the race is if they break away and they can actually make it to the finish before the peloton if if you know anything about bike racing you'll know that the breakaway rarely succeeds but every once in a while it does Right. Right. Um, I guess jumping back to, uh, to your, your gravel racing, kind of what you're doing this summer to put it in a perspective for people. Um, what, what, well, what's the biggest race that you'll do this summer? One off. Yeah. So the biggest race of the year already happened. It was the unbound 200, which is a 200 mile gravel race. Um, it's probably the biggest gravel race in the world at this point. Um, so there's just, there's just a lot of media around it. Um, every year the competition gets stiffer and stiffer. They're, they're, you know, a ton of former world tour pros, you know, former riders who rode in the tour de France that show up. Um, and the race is in, in Kansas in the U S but you know, it's not just U S riders. I mean, it's riders from, from all around the world showing up for it. Um, so that was probably the biggest race that I did this year. Um, but this, this whole lifetime Grand Prix that I was talking about, all six of the races on that calendar are, are a pretty big deal. And this, this race that I'm training for right now is part of that series. And the whole reason I'm in Colorado is because I'm acclimating to altitude. It's the Leadville 100, which is in Leadville, Colorado, which is Leadville is at, uh, 10,000 feet altitude. And then I think the highest point in the race is 12,000 feet. So it's a super high altitude race. And if you, if you want to do well, you got to acclimate. So what do, what does that, um, sorry, it's unbound gravel. That's what they call it. Right. What does that race pay to win? Nothing, nothing really. Yeah. But so, uh, if you're, if you're thinking in the short term and not the long term, you might say, okay, why would I even target that race? I'm going to get, if I win the race, uh, what's the time? But, but if you, if you were to win that race or not even win the race, but just get a good result, like a top 10 finish or a top 20 finish, you could turn that result into sponsorship money next year. I mean, if, if you were to win the race, that is, that's, for these gravel racers, that is a career changing victory right there. Um, like whatever, whatever prize money they would give you would be peanuts compared to whatever sponsors would give you next year. Right. So it's, it's, 
you know, so much like our racing as well. So much of it is sponsorship driven. You, you, even if you go out and win every race, you can't, can't afford to do it. Is that pretty similar? Yeah. So a lot of these races do have prize money, but it's, it's not a lot. I mean, like I said, 500 to a thousand dollars, which considering how expensive bike racing is, uh, if you were relying solely on prize money, you wouldn't break even. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so yeah, I, if you're, if you want to make money bike racing, then, then you need sponsors. So for a guy like you, are you spending more time trying to hunt sponsorship or does it make more financial sense for you to focus on YouTube? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I can break that down a little bit. I, I kind of have three sources of income um, and that would be YouTube coaching and then bike racing. Um, YouTube obviously, you know, pays with ad revenue. Uh, and it's not, I mean, it's not a ton of money, but it's something, yep. um, just for people who don't know the, the advertisements that you see before the YouTube videos that you watch 50% of the money that that advertiser had to pay to get that ad shown goes to the creator and 50% goes to YouTube. So whatever creator you're watching, it's getting paid when you click on their video. Um, and then, and then coaching, uh, I sell online training plans. And then I've got, I've got this coaching company. I've got coaches working for me. That's a source of income. And then racing is, like I said, that's mostly from sponsorships, uh, you know, a little bit of prize money here and there, but sponsorships is the bull. Right. Right. So to jump back in for my, my racing fans, you know, a lot of guys in, in stock car racing, um, you know, there is, there certainly is an appreciation for aero, but I, you know, I think it's, it's, overlooked to a large degree um compared to bicycle racing you know you hear all the time wow you're not going fast enough for that to make a difference can you kind of dispel that a little bit in a, with... in a car race they're saying that oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah uh well i'll be honest we have the same debates in bike racing there are people that that don't care about aero that don't think aero matters or maybe they know that aero matters, but they're just like, you know, it's too much of a headache for me to even dive into or think about. I'm just going to, I, I'm a complete aero geek. I have all the aero stuff. I've got aero socks, aero helmet, skin suit, skin suit being a, you know, the, uh, like the shorts and the Jersey are one piece and it's very tight. Um, I, my, my bike is, is super aero. <laughs> I run aero bars for gravel racing when they're allowed. That's a huge debate right now in gravel racing. Um, so, so all this stuff, I guess, to outsiders and even to people in the sport and not even like novices in the sport, straight up professionals in the sport will be like, ah, well, how much of a difference does that make? Um, some of this stuff is a very small difference. Like you know, I don't know, running aero socks versus not aero socks. I don't know, over a hundred miles, that might be four minutes, three minutes, right? It's something, That's but it's huge. not it's still pretty sure, big. Sure. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, let's take the aero bar thing though. And I've actually, I've actually calculated. So this is not a guess on my part. This is actually a calculation that I've done. Um, Can you just quickly, just quickly tell people what aero bars are if they have no idea? Sure. Right. Right. So this is not a cycling audience. They might not know. So a traditional road cycling handlebar, uh, hopefully most people know what that looks like. It's it's got the drops. um, It's got the hoods and the flat section. So if you mount aero bars onto your bike, it's, it's what you might see on a, on a time trial bike. It's, it's where there's, they're mounted kind of, towards the center of the bar, they've got pads. And then there are these extensions. So some people call them skis so that you put your elbows on the pads and then you grab, grab onto the extensions so that when you're in the aero bars, your body is way more hunched over and your arms are in, right? So you can imagine, so it's kind of like a position that a ski racer would adopt when they're tucking, right? Mm-hmm. Like a downhill ski racer, when they're tucking with their poles, um, 
hopefully most people have seen ski racing when downhill ski racers do that or when cross country ski racers do that as well. Yeah. But it, it kind of looks like that. And so obviously you can imagine, okay, like that sounds a lot more aerodynamic and it is a lot more aerodynamic. Um, so, so let's take the unbound 200. Now you can't, the terrain is rugged enough that you can't be in the aero bars for the entire 200 miles, but you, you could probably be in the aero bars for 50 of the 200 miles when you take into account the fact that, um, you know, you're going to be in the group a little bit and you can't use the aero bars and you're going to be climbing and you can't use the aero bars and you're going to be downhilling and you can't use the aero bars. It's really something that you need to use for the flat sections when you're alone. So let's say you could use aero bars for 50 miles. That's a, if you were to use aero bars for 50 miles versus just riding in the hoods, that's 20 minutes. Insane. Like in insane, even that four minute number that you told me on aero socks, like, you know, you're thinking about a lap in a race car and it's like, if you're a second off, you're same with bicycle racing. Like you're way off the pace. You're out to lunch. Four minutes over the course of a race is huge. Like how, how are, why is it not just, why is everyone, why does everyone not have aero bars? Why is everyone not wearing aero socks? Why is everyone not looking for all that, that free power? Right. So, I mean, this is, this is the, this is what has me scratching my head because I'm completely in agreement with you. I don't know why everyone doesn't just do everything that's optimal, including the aero bar thing. Cause the aero bar, so some of these things are what's called marginal gains, which means they're going to give you a marginal improvement. That's a pretty popular term in cycling. I don't know if you guys use that term in sure. race car driving, but so I don't even consider the aero bars a marginal gain. I just consider it a gain. Um, I mean, 20 minutes is not a marginal gain over <laughs> a 200 mile race. I mean, a 200 mile race is going to take 10 to 11 hours. So 20 minutes, you know, when you put it into perspective like that, it's, you know, again, it's not, it's not, it's not going to make you win the race if, <laughs> but like it's, it's something right. It, mm-hmm. It's, it's a, pretty sizable difference um so yeah i i and and there's there's this weird culture in gravel racing where like i don't know if you're a pro gravel racer you can't take it too seriously because if you're taking it too seriously it's uncool for you to do that for some reason i i completely shun all of that and i'm like i'm taking this seriously i'm trying to win and i'm gonna do everything i possibly can to do that um like one of the arguments that I use actually comes from race car driving. I'll I'll talk to people about, you know, like look at F1 drivers. They do every single thing that they possibly can within the rules and sometimes not within the rules, right. (laughs) To go as fast as they possibly can. Like they're constantly trying to think outside the box, right. Equipment wise. And there, there there's, there's cyclists that do that, but there are plenty of cyclists that don't do that as well. (laughs) Hmm. That's, uh, that's funny. That's my next question for you. I ask every single race car driver I have on and I, uh, I stole this from Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s podcast. He, he always asks, um, if you have any good, he calls it innovation, you know, if not just outright cheating, uh, is there any, any good innovation stories? Um, maybe that, that the average person doesn't know about bicycle racing over the course of the history or even, you know, contemporary stuff. Uh, sure. Yeah, probably one of the most, so I'll, 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 I'll give you the one that has to do with aero bars and it's, and it's really famous cause it was actually at the tour de France. So Greg LeMond, um, won the tour. I don't know what the year it was. It was late seventies or early eighties or something. The, the first time he won the tour de France, the, the final, he was, um, him and Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Finian, I think was his name, were very close in the GC battle. GC battle meaning the who overall has the fastest time over the course of the 20, 20 stage race, right? And the final stage of the race was a time trial, meaning that the riders are not in a peloton, they're riding solo to get the fastest time possible. Um, and at the time, so now everybody uses aero bars. And not only did they use aero bars, they use time trial bikes 
when it's a time trial, which have arrow bars. Arrow bars are not allowed if it's a mass start road race, but, but they are allowed if it's a time trial, solo time trial, and everyone uses them, obviously. But so at the time, that was not, that was not a thing because, you know, this was, this was before people realized how much aerodynamics make a difference. But um, I think one of his sponsors had just come out with these aero bars. I think it was probably Scott he came out with these aero bars and he put them on his bike for the time trial. And he won the time trial by eight seconds. <laughs> and those, those aero bars wait, made way more of a difference than eight seconds. I mean, if he had not had the aero bars on his bike, he would have lost that time trial by minutes. Wow. Right? And he wouldn't have won the tour. So he, he won the time trial and he won the, the tour, um, I think, by eight seconds. Wow. It was such a small difference. And, and when, you, when you look at all the things that Lawrence Finion did wrong, so he, at the time, riders didn't wear helmets, but Greg LeMond wore an arrow helmet. And Lawrence Finion didn't wear a helmet and he's got a ponytail <laughs> there are people saying that if he had just like shaved his head instead of having a ponytail, because a ponytail is not aerodynamic at all, there's a flop, flapping hair in the wind, that, that would have been the eight second difference right there. <laughs> wow. Um, so that's, that's just one example, but that, you know, there's, there's other examples like that. Is there, like, is there anything to tiny electric, because I'm thinking as a race car driver so much in the bicycle, is there anything to tiny electric motors? You mean electric motors powering the bike? Yeah. So there has only been one rider, and it was a uh, under twenty three year old girl in cyclocross racing. Interestingly enough, um, who got caught with a motor in her bike? Okay. That doesn't mean that's the only person who's ever had a motor in their bike. I'm sure there. I'm sure other people have that just haven't been caught. Um, now they, the, now they test for that. They've got, they've got like an x-ray thing where they can try to see if you have a motor in your bike. Um, but it's totally, I mean, it's totally possible to make a motor that's small enough that makes, you know, little to no noise that provides a little, uh, you know, enough extra Watts that you could win a race. Yeah. You know, it's not, it, <laughs> If you're completely out of shape, you're <laughs> yeah. not gonna you're not gonna win the race. Like it's probably 50 extra watts, right? It's not, um, but but if you're already fit, I mean, it could, you know, yeah. Um, right. So one person has been caught, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure it's happened before. Right. I think the more common the more common thing with bicycle racing, obviously, is is performance enhancing drugs. When everyone thinks of bi bicycle racing. Um, I just wanted to get the the bike like the actual bike stuff out of the way, but um, in your like gravel races, are you guys tested uh, stuff like that? Yeah, so uh, right now gravel racing is pretty new, and um, like the discipline of gravel racing, I mean, there's been gravel races going on for fifteen plus years, but I would say gravel racing as a discipline is probably five-ish years old like it's a very new discipline of cycling and it's kind of the wild west right now uh, mm. a lot of races don't have testing but this lifetime grand prix that i'm in does have testing that being said it's not very good testing it's testing where they're testing you at the event um and the you know the issue with that is that you could have doped months ago when you were training and been you know gotten a little bit of an edge but you're not going to test positive now that you're at the event which is why in the world tour uh like the riders doing the tour de france they have something called the biological passport mm -hmm. where they're taking blood markers year round and trying to see if there's discrepancies and if there is that could be an indication of doping um so you know, it's not like they're just testing at the event or just testing, you know, at once a month, every month or, or maybe I, I, I don't know how, how often they're taking these blood markers, but basically what I'm trying to say is that they're constantly monitored and they didn't always have this in place. Like when Lance Armstrong was at his prime, they didn't have a biological passport, right? Probably part of the reason why he could, you know, 
do so much EPO. Um, and the biological passport is not foolproof. Like you could theoretically get around it. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a doping expert or a doping doctor, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much I could go into that, but but there are probably still riders doping, although it, it's it's a cleaner sport than it used to be. And just just as a way of proving that, um, like the times up some of these climbs are still not as fast as they were in the '90s and early 2000s. And you have to take into consideration that the technology, like the bikes that they're on are a lot faster, a lot better. So if they're not going as fast up these climbs with faster bikes, you know, yeah, it's, they're not they're If they're doping at the very least, they're not doping to the extent that they used to be. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you think about, I guess like medical stuff in, in uh, I'm trying to think about like racing and golf, a big one for sure would have to be like ADHD medication. Like that, that has to be huge. And that, that has to have some big effect on, on endurance athletes as well. You know, it's, you know, when you're essentially taking some kind of methamphetamine or something close to it. Yeah, sure. I, um, I'm sure it's on the banned substance list. The banned substance list is very long. There's a lot of things that you can't take unless mm-hmm. you have a TUE for it, therapeutic right. use exemption. Um, I don't know everything that's on the banned substance list, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I'd imagine, you know, I've, I've heard stuff like half the guys on the PGA Tour and half the, the cup-level NASCAR guys have AD, ADD. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> it's also, I mean, we, we have the same joke in cycling it's like why why did half the half the world tour riders have asthma and they need asthma medicine right <laughs> you know right. what i mean these are like the the best endurance athletes in the world and all of them have asthma it like doesn't add up right right no for sure um i guess one more question i, I was scrolling through your videos and i saw you did a an in-depth video i'm, I'm halfway through it on um kind of breaking down the science on transgender athletes. Did you get any, and it was super scientific, not political at all, your video, but did you get any, any blowback from that? Or did you have to, you know, have long discussions with people? Yeah. Uh, blowback would be an understatement. It was, really? it was, uh, I mean, I've, I've made controversial videos in the past. Um, but I, obviously the transgender thing is such, such a, contentious topic right now um not just in sports but i mean just any transgender issue that you're talking about um i guess for those of for those of you who haven't watched it which i'm assuming is most of the people listening i i broke down the science there there is research on whether or not transgender um and when we're talking about transgender athletes right we're talking about transgender women competing in women's sports so there is research on whether or not uh transgender women reducing their testosterone, uh, whether or not that brings them to the level of, of, you know, cisgender, which means biological women, um, does it bring them down to that level? And I mean, the re, you know, we could always use more research, just like every single topic, but I would say the balance of evidence right now would suggest that no, it doesn't bring them down to that level. And in fact, there were, you know, there were studies that um, showed that the, I'm trying to remember, like after 12 months of hormone treatment, their strength had actually hardly reduced at all, um, wow. interestingly enough. And it certainly was not close to the level of, of a typical female. So, and, and, and in my mind, and the, the Olympic committee has, They've been doing a lot of changing to the rules since I did that video, but at the time, the 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 threshold that you needed to get under for your testosterone was um, ten nanomoles per liter, I believe, is the units. And to put that into perspective, typical male testosterone levels are ten nanomoles per liter to thirty nanomoles per liter. Typical female levels are, I don't know, 0.5 to two point five nanomoles per liter. 
So getting under 10 animals per liter, it's like, yeah, you're under the typical male, but you're still nowhere close to the typical female, right? Um, and you only need to be at that level for 12 months, which is not a lot of time. Right. So basically my conclusion in that video was, and I, I was talking a lot about the Olympics, the Olympic rules, because that is elite sport and elite, in my mind, elite sport matters a lot more than if you're just doing sports recre recreationally, who cares? You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Um, so basically my conclusion was, you know, these rules are, these rules are on, um, at the Olympic level. And yeah, I mean, what, what's funny is that if you go to that video on YouTube, it's got like a 95% like to dislike ratio, which is crazy for such a controversial topic. Right. I mean, I have videos about satellite that have a worse ratio than that. <laughs> and the comments are overwhelmingly positive and people are like, this is a great video, very objective. Look at the science, cool. Um, it was on Instagram that, that things blew up. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, there was, there was one particular transgender woman who does cyclocross and gravel racing who initially made a post about my video and she, you know she's a very high profile transgender cyclist mm. and it seemed like after she made that post it was like the spark that set off the forest fire like i they were going after my sponsors i lost one sponsor thankfully my the rest of my sponsors st stuck with me but um yeah, I, my, my, there were 400 or so comments under her post and then my post on Instagram about the video, which was, vi I didn't, I don't even think I said the word transgender in my post about the video. It was just saying like, hey, I've got a new video on a controversial topic. Go check it out. Right. That has like 400 comments too of people arguing. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know. It was disappointing to see because in my, I don't have any horse in that race, right? Like, right. I'm not, I'm not a female racer and I'm not a, I'm not a transgender female racer. So I like, I don't, you know, I don't have a bias either way. I'm just looking at the research on, on a hot topic right now. And that's, that's the conclusion I came to is, I don't know. Right. Huh. Did you get, did you ever get any like in, in-person confrontation or is it all just online? It was... Yeah, it was all online. I'm trying to remember if, I mean, I've talked to people in person about the video and I've talked to people who disagree with the video in person about it, but it's not like we had an argument about it. It was just, sure. it was just a conversation. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, that's good. Before we, uh, yeah, before we wrap up, um, anything else you want to share, add? Mm, I don't know. We, we covered a lot. You yeah. know, most, most podcasters don't ask me about the transgender video. That's like, it's like too touchy. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's it's actually funny. Um I was I went to an osteopath last week and he's uh he's on the Sports Canada committee or something and he was talking about like specifically for that issue on on what Sports Canada is going to do. Um so we were having a discussion about it so it was it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. It's it's a, definitely a hot topic right now. I, I how do you, how do you, how do the, the genders separate in car racing? So there is no, uh, only, I, I'm probably wrong by a couple of years, but the first female series started, I don't know, four years ago. Um, but before that it was all just, all just mixed, you know, it's, um, you know, and I, I it's funny. I was, I don't want to get into it too much, but I was asking him about it or he asked me about it. The same question you just asked he's a he's a triathlete guy and he said yeah what do they do for car racing i said nothing you know it's it, it's probably fair and he had just gone through all the data and his opinion was no it's probably not fair you know there's just it's it's so you know men and women are biologically different on so many different levels and so many different on average measurable measurable differences right yeah. And, and, you know, I think, uh, I think probably a lot of people who don't know a lot about car racing, I'm, I don't know a lot about car racing, but I do know 
What I do know is that it's a lot more physical than people think, right? People assume you're sitting in a car and so the car is doing all the work. But as we've already discussed, heart rates can get super high, heat acclimation obviously very important, and it's actually very physical when you're doing it, when you're racing a car. And and I have I have read absolutely no studies. I don't think a study exists that looks at the difference in genders for car racing, but if I had to give a guess right now, based off of the research that I've done for other things, I would say that, yeah, there's probably, there's probably a small difference in, in the capability of the genders for car racing. It's probably right. not massive. It's probably not to the same extent as like weightlifting, right? But there's probably a small difference is what I would have to guess. Yeah, I'd I'd probably agree, and and then like all these discussions, it's it's on average. There's obviously individuals, you know. There's obviously chicks out there that would kick my ass in a shifter cart, which is you know arguably the most physically demanding form of racing in the world, you know, as far as right. auto racing goes. Um, so, you know, there's there's individuals, but these discussions happen on average, which I think a lot of people don't appreciate. Sure, sure, I. I one, so one of the arguments that I see a lot is like from the transgender thing is like, oh, well, you know, transgender um, athletes are not are not taking over women's sports. Like there's a few examples here and there, but it's not like, you know, it's not like all you see is transgender athletes when you turn on women's sports. Right. Um, and so, I mean. The answer to that is like, well, you know, transgender is, is a pretty small proportion of the population, but, but like, just because a transgender athlete doesn't win a race or, or a competition, a sporting competition does not mean that they don't have an advantage. Right. Right. Like you could uh, just an analogy, somebody who's really fat and out of shape could enter the tour de France with an e-bike that gives them a hundred extra Watts and they would still get last place and they still had an unfair advantage over all the other people that didn't have an e-bike. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like just because you don't do well doesn't mean you didn't have an unfair advantage. Yep. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's a, uh, that's not a good argument. Uh, that, that argument, you know, well, I didn't win is not a good argument. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, like if we're talking about the fastest female cyclist in the world, there's probably like, <laughs> there's probably only, you know, 1% of the population that, that could actually, less than that, that could actually ride, of men that could yeah. ride faster than these women. These women are so fast. But like, if you put a pro men, a pro man versus a pro woman, it's not even close. So, right. yeah. Yeah. No, I think the, the women's series is good in racing. And I, um, you know, but it's, I think a lot of, I've raced against girls in, in almost every series, every once in a while you're racing against girls and it's, it's just, you know, you got to give them kudos. It's tough. You're going out there, you got to contend with the boys and, um, try and break that stigma. So it's always been kind of a, a cool thing as far as girls in, in racing goes. And there's, there's just frankly, never going to be enough women in motorsports to really have those series on every level. Yeah. I don't know what it is about. I mean, there's, there's less women in bike racing as well. Um, uh, and there's probably many factors for that, but, um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, I'm speaking out of line here, but it just seems like women are less into cars. Yeah, no, I think that's probably just simply the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Man, before we wrap up, where uh, tell everyone where they can uh, where they can find you, where they can follow along, look for your next race, all the above. Sure, yeah. So my YouTube channel is just my name, Dylan Johnson, and um, so yeah, you can check me out there. My my Instagram is Dylan Johnson, although Johnson is spelled J A W N S O N instead of the normal way. Um, I guess I'm on Facebook too. <laughs> uh, I've got a, I've got two podcasts at this point. Um, one is just like off the cuff. It's called bonk bros. We're just talking about whatever's going on in cycling. One is a little bit more nerdy and training oriented. That's the matchbox podcast. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. No, I appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to a guy who's very much new to cycling and doesn't know what he's talking about. So 
Yeah, it was good. I think this is the first time I, I've done a podcast with a, a car racer. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. I'll, uh, I'll send you all the stuff and, uh, and you can share it and, and whatnot. I'll tag you in it on Instagram and I'll put all your YouTube stuff in the show notes. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on. Hope you guys enjoyed that podcast. Dylan Johnson, share it with anyone, you know, who's into cycling. They're going to get a kick out of his channel. See you guys next week.